guess it's time to start. Uh, good morning. Um, for the people born, you can fill out the survey there uh, now or uh, any time this week or next week. Um, <clears throat> all right. So, so where are we in the course? Uh, so let's try to uh, take a little bit of a broader view. So, um, so what happened so far? Um, so we started with this, this idea of like, uh, I don't know, condensed sets, condensed the being curved and so on. So it calls framework condensed mathematics. And we tried to make the point that this is a good framework uh, for, for combining homological algebra uh, and function analysis. And the goal is somehow to use this framework to develop a general this notion of um, geometry. Um, <clears throat> but then at some point, we somehow made a, wanted a notion of completeness. So, uh, And um, and at that point, we we went into a certain direction, namely we sort of uh, were concentrating on the solid series. So we had the solid modules um, first over the integers, but then over R, let's say any finite type. Z algebra, as uh, Dustin discussed it last time in particular, um, or in fact, some any Hoover pairs. And uh, well, this this is closely related to uh, this. It's good for non intermediate geometry. Um, and it's a specific uh, framework we discussed that is really extremely closely related to Hoover's theory of eddy spaces. Uh, and I mean, there were certainly uh, some conceptual ideas that emerged uh, from uh, from this, namely that uh, this notion of completeness shouldn't be something that you define once and for all, uh, but rather is, is an extra datum that is somehow part of the datum of like what a commutative ring is in the setup. Um, So completeness is some all relative notion, in some sense. So it's not an absolute notion of big functions for all, but it's part of the datum of an analytic range. So which modules are complete is part of the datum of what we <coughs> then define. That's an analytic question. <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> uh, so, <clears throat> so what will, will are we trying to further do in the course? Uh, Um, so we have the study of analytic rings, 
and maybe uh, for reasons that we already saw a little bit that when you localize some of the structures even might become not seven degree zero anymore. Um, we <clears throat> might change the precise definition here a little bit to some of the law derived rings from the start. Uh, but this is something I don't want to go into today. Um, but so we want to start from this kind of analytic rings and use these as our build, basic building blocks to then form, like as usual, an, an algebraic geometry you start with commutative rings and then you build schemes by gluing the spectra of commutative rings. And similar, there should be some procedure where you start with this kind of analytic rings and then do some some kind of gluing to produce some kind of notion of analytic spaces, or maybe people directly actually go to some kind of specs. Um, <clears throat> what is some kind of uh, gluing procedure? Um, <clears throat> so there will be uh, some very general such class that we will introduce at some point. Um, and but then within within this world, we want to find uh, all sorts of uh, find this and find within the where is classical Okay, um, but certainly we want our theory to not just be a non Euclidean theory. We definitely want uh, to accommodate also geometry over the analytic geometry over the real or complex numbers. And so, uh, so but first, uh, we would like to see more examples. Uh, Of analytic rings. So some of the key questions maybe are <laughs> um, um, do the real numbers. Uh, have a natural structure. You know, that's somewhat suitable for doing analytic like, complex or real analytic geometry. <laughs> and another important question is, uh, if you can put some natural analytic research on the real numbers, um, and so you can do some kind of Archimedean analytic geometry, but also the other end, also it's not Archimedean analytic geometry uh, using the solid modules, um, maybe. And then there's a question whether there's a meaningful way to combine uh, combine the two settings. So is there a good way? Uh, so we'll combine. Not a community, a community. Um, and there might be several different ways of how one might uh, try to start to think about this. Um, I want to develop one way. Uh, uh, um, <clears throat> with the following example really uh, uh, in mind. So maybe the most prime example really of, an, of what one should be able to do in some world of analytic geometry, so here, yeah, some key example that we want to accommodate um, is the famous table of the trick. Um, 
So let me spend a little bit of time just talking about this. Uh, what is this? Um, right, so, uh, so the elliptic curve, say, is some elliptic curve E, E or EQ, um, that can be defined, for example, uh, over the ring D the wrong series of G. And, uh, here's one way to define it. That's basically uh, using uh, the framework of edit equations. So it's actually, uh, if you look at Huber's paper, I think it's the one called the generalization of formal schemes and something like that. Um, <clears throat> there really is also one of the first applications of the theory. He's again discussing like the tail elliptic curve and that's a generalization to apply dimensional BM varieties. <clears throat> um, so, you, you have the edit spectrum of like just call the wrong series algebra, uh, call, call the power series algebra. <clears throat> and then over there, you can look at some of the GM as an analytic space, GM over. So, intuitively speaking, that's uh, all the uh, like there's some coordinate t here, and t should have the property as the absolute value of t um, is bounded between some uh, some bound powers of the infinite value. Of t. So Q is some on top of you put the element in there, and then you look at the part uh, of the multiplicative group where uh, the absolute value of T is somewhat bounded by, by power. Um, <clears throat> and then acting on here, you have multiplication by T. <clears throat> and uh, this is actually a totally discontinuous operation because it multiplies the absolute value of T by the absolute value of Q, which is like something between zero and one. Um, so it's actually uh, free and totally discontinuous action. Uh, and so in the world of any spaces, you can really pass to the quotient and the, taking this quotient is the nicest kind of quotient, yeah, but, uh, just get a, where the quotient is like locally split and locally, locally the quotient space just looks like this. <laughs> and so you can define EQ to be Uh, this analytic gm, and then you quotient by q to the z. And I mean, how does it look like? I mean, you, you started with, with, I don't know, in the end, and then multiplication by q uh, is moving everything towards the origin. But then when you take the quotient, it's somehow the same thing as taking some annulus of radius. Uh, one to one of the just the value of Q and then identifying boundary and line. <clears throat> and so using this, you can actually see that this is some, uh, yeah, 
it's actually proper so it's, I think for the compact and all the separated. Um, it's also smooth because it's locally just a gem. It's proper smooth selected curve, analytic curve all over. <clears throat> and actually, it also, if, I mean, there's a group work structure on GM. It's coded by subgroups that actually have a group structure, you know, community group structure. Um, and then, <laughs> and basically in any world of analytic geometry, there should be a theorem that something proper smooth one dimensional is always algebraic because uh, you can always find an ample divisor by just taking uh, any closed point and then taking the corresponding inverse ideal sheet. Um, this gives an ample line bundle. And then, uh, I mean, if you have any kind of version of Riemann Rohr in your theory, which you should always have, so you can show that they're not functions. I mean, to, the proof algebraicity of the thing, and so this happened to be true here. So there's actually uh, so uh, so here the implicitly there is some gaga for over a nice Noetherian uh, uh, basic Huber pairs, but also the statement about relative dimension one it works over an non-Archimedean field that a proper curve uh, uh, prop, uh, is uh, projective, but if you have a more general basis like spa of something uh, like here, then of course locally for the analytic topology you can use formal models, some device to get formal model with relative dimension ones, and it is easy yeah. to construct you an ample line yeah. bundle, but to globalize it here you have a section actually which you gives you an ample device, so the identity section of, but in general I'm not sure if it is clear that the proper relative dimension one over a nice base uh, of course, locally, analytically, it is projective by using some formal models, but I'm not sure about uh, what happens globally over spa of nice pairs. So, but it's not the deal. I, but, I guess but, I should but, that I have a section, okay, which what? I do because this is a clue, right? So, so this, but anyway, so in this case, it's not so hard to show this automatically algebra, right? And on the end, it just defines an algebraic elliptic curve somehow. Defines an elliptic curve over just, I mean, in the end, it's just an elliptic curve over the abstract power series. I mean, it, in between, we somehow use, <clears throat> use some kind of topological or condensed structure on this new series Q, but in the end, we just get an elliptic curve over the abstract rings in the series Q. Um, <clears throat> and okay, so it's an elliptic curve, so you can write down in right press equation for it. Um, and, uh, uh, so if you write down the wise press equation, I mean, for, I guess, if you remove the zero section as usual, um, <clears throat> then you can write in the following form. Uh, I copied this from Wikipedia, so I hope it's correct. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, so to write down integral, and usually you can omit this term, but uh, usually you have to invert, invert two to do this. So uh, if you don't, you should put it in this form. Um, and then these are some power series in Q. And what are they? Uh, my notes told me I should write the form. Okay. <clears throat> so 
So, I don't know. I mean, this definition looks rather simple to me. These formulas look rather complicated to me. <coughs> But when I first, first saw those formulas, I remember that I was struck that if you actually look at the coefficients, okay, so you don't actually see the coefficients of q to the n in here. But I mean, okay, so it's easy to invert 1 minus q to the n, right? It's 1 plus q to the n plus 1, q to the 2n and so on. And so if you imagine doing that, then, <clears throat> I mean, here's the coefficients, they are just polynomial at n, right? And I mean, when you do this uh, standard geometric series here, I mean, the new coefficients are still stay polynomial on n. Uh, so some kind of final observation is that, uh, 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 the Fourier coefficients, well, the coefficients, of q to the n, uh, for polynomial growth in range. <laughs> um, this implies in particular, um, Like, I prefer we just to find something where we follow the wrong series ring. Really. But then when you actually write down this equation, you realize that this is something that you can specialize uh, to any uh, <clears throat> also not to any Archimedean value uh, between 0 and 1. And while that would have also been clear, uh, from this kind of analytic description. I mean, you can certainly take like C star as a, uh, as a complex analytic space, as a complex manifold. And for any complex number between zero and one, I mean, now this picture makes literal sense. Uh, I mean, you can literally take that quotient and you get an actual torus, right? And uh, so, <clears throat> so you can do that, but also uh, the analytic description. Uh, SPN on Q to the V uh, makes perfect sense there. <clears throat> so, so we would really like to have a, uh, uh, <clears throat> yeah. To be able to do our analytic geometry so that we can somehow prefer form this kind of construction of like an analytic GM or Q to the Z, not just over uh, the full or wrong series algebra, but really over some sub algebra where we put some growth condition on the coefficient so that we can <coughs> also later on specialize uh, to an Archimedean part. Um, note, however, that the precise growth condition that you get here is quite a bit stricter. Than just the observations that you can plug that it converges when the output value of Q is less than one. Uh, uh, so convergence um, this is just a sub exponential growth of the coefficients. Um, but I mean, I even if you think about it, maybe if you think about, yeah. So it's pretty clear that there should, there should be a geometric reason that, that geometrically should be pretty clear that this force series should converge uh, when Q is less than one. Uh, so the, there's some kind of direct geometric way of seeing that the, whatever coefficients you're getting here that the coefficients must have at most uh, uh, some exponential growth. Uh, but it's not so clear how you would see that they actually have most polynomial growth, whether there's a geometric reason for that.
Um, all right. Um, so uh, let me actually talk before I'm really getting again to this uh, more comedian theory. Let me actually talk a little bit about uh, the geometry of the space space. Uh, so those are the continuous valuations on 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 zero long series Q. Um, <clears throat> so so I don't know. So if you have some, they call variations, but I still want to denote some absolute values. So it's uh. This to some gamma union zero. <clears throat> and so in particular, the absolute value of Q uh, will be a certain element in here. It will actually not be zero, so it's certainly actually in the, in the gamma part. Um, and <clears throat> it turns out that like you have this top law in Newton unit and this is actually an extremely convenient structure to have because it allows you to compare absolute values of all other functions against the absolute value of, of Q, just like we did here. When we had some other function, like the current function on GM, we can somehow gauge how large it is by comparing it to the absolute value of Q. <clears throat> and this is something you can always do once you have such a topology new potent unit. Um, and so this, in particular, this means that there's actually a unique map here to the real square equal to zero, um, which sends the absolute value of Q to some pre-specified element between zero and one, and uh, let's just choose a half. Um, and for most of the valuations that we care about here, um, this will actually be injective, but there's some rank two valuations where there's a little bit of extra information in the gamma that's not remembered by this portion. But, but in first approximation, you can really um, <clears throat> Think uh, right. So this gives a map uh, from this edit spectrum. <clears throat> um, towards what's known as a Berkowitz spectrum. Maybe there are several M's that will appear, so let me call it M Berk. Uh, <clears throat> um, Here for a uh, fun of an R. So recall that um, <clears throat> uh, I just see long series Q is an example of such a Tate Hoover ring. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I already said last time that this can really be endowed with a Banach norm, where this, uh, this thing becomes a, a unit ball. And then again, if you space it, uh, Specify what the absolute value of Q should be, you can suddenly decide what's the absolute value of anything this way. Looking at uh, so. uh, the power of Q that you need to make it integral and then taking the corresponding power of the half. So uh, for a bundle ring R, um, uh, could you write a slightly larger? Yes. Thanks. Uh, sorry. Well, maybe just use the next one. Mission 
this is set of all. Uh, now let me call, again call them absolute values, but now they really take uh, values in R greater or equal to zero. And now you ask the following things. Uh, well, first of all, I don't know, there's some stupid things like normal zero is zero, normal one is one. Um, <clears throat> it's not duplicative for normal x times y, so normal x times normal y. A break which here, I mean, back here, these are valuations, uh, which in particular satisfies this strong triangle inequality. Uh, <clears throat> Berkowitz which theory is not restricted to the non equity thing, so it considers the usual triangle inequality. <clears throat> But he also asked that they have, all of them should be bounded by the norm um, you have specified on, on R. Um, and now I'm going exactly how, how he sets it up, where he says it's less or equal to a constant times this, but I think in this case it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> And so this naturally maps to, to a product of copies of R greater or equal to zero, enumerated by all the elements X and R. And uh, he endows this with a subspace topology. So actually, uh, because of this condition, you can actually replace R greater equal to zero here, but always by the interval from zero to the absolute value of X. <clears throat> and so then these are all compact intervals. And then an arbitrary uh, product of compact host of space is still compact host of, so there's still a compact space. <clears throat> and all the other conditions that you see here, they are all closed subspaces. So there's actually a closed subspace. <clears throat> and so particular, the Berkowitz space is actually a nice compact house of space. And then there's actually a factor of this situation <clears throat> that actually the only difference between these two spaces here <clears throat> is the possibility that in the edX spectrum you can have higher ranked things. <clears throat> but these higher ranked things, they give rise just to some uh, very infinitesimal changes in the space. So actually, uh, this quotient that's it, or this map here from the edX spectrum, the Berkowitz spectrum. There's actually a maximal house of culture. <laughs> uh, so the two are extremely similar. Note here that uh, implicitly I'm endowing the integers here with a norm where zero, the norm of zero is zero, and the norm of all elements is one because they are all contained as a unit ball of the ring I'm considering. Okay, so he has this uh, edX space for this. And so I still want to understand a little bit about this geometry. <clears throat> it's more or less the same thing as anyways as the Berkowitz space. 
Um, but that actually all maps down to the Berkowitz space of the integers. And I mean, usually if you have any kind of spectrum of the integers, well, it doesn't have a rich geometry, maybe. I mean, they have a prime, so maybe one generic one or something, I guess. But actually the Berkowitz space of the integers is much more interesting. Um, so here's here the proposition. Uh, maybe I should stress here. Yes. <laughs> norm on Z is so the implicit part of norm on Z. I mean, it's, yeah, it's the one where the norm of zero is zero, and, but the norm of any N which is not zero is one. Because all of them are contained in this box. <clears throat> um, but there is a in some sense more natural uh, norm you can put on Z and just the usual absolute value. Right, uh, so let me draw both of them. For the norm which is zero or one. Um, I'm not sure to denote it. Um, <clears throat> um, this is the following thing. Um, <laughs> so actually, this very norm, it is satisfies all the properties. The norm of zero is zero, the norm of one is one, blah, 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 blah. Um, so it actually defines a point. It's a more or less a generic point. <clears throat> Uh, but of course, you know many other natural uh, absolute values on the integers, namely for any prime number p, you have to p the absolute value, and it also satisfies all those properties there. <laughs> but whenever you take the p the absolute value, you actually have a choice, I mean, what is the absolute value of p? <laughs> and so for each prime number p, you actually have a full line uh, of possible, like, full interval, like going from zero to one. I'm not running bigger, I guess. Um, and then there's also a close point at the end of this ray uh, where you go to FP. Um, so you can also get such an absolute value if you first project from Z to FP and then do this kind of thing that zero goes to zero and everything that's non zero goes to one. Okay, and so you can do so this corresponds to two, this corresponds to three, and so on. Corresponds to five, and then for for each prime number, uh, you have such a ray, and then um, some kind of inverse limit of joining one ray at a time. Uh, right, so the following points. <clears throat> so the points they more or less correspond to maps to to. Complete Banach fields, um, and so, so there's one that corresponds to Q with a kind of trivial absolute value. <clears throat> okay, first go from Z to Q, and then to this thing, which just recovers as a absolute value. So this corresponds to Q here. <clears throat> then you can go to QP for any P, and the absolute value. Of With the norm of p being any specified element in the interval from zero to one, <clears throat> and then f p again with the trivial
Um, right. Uh, let me also already discuss now um, the cyber agent of this. So you can also take the Berkowitz space of the integers, but the usual absolute value. I mean, so the norm of n is yeah, minus n. Um, the positive version of it. Um, so this is the same picture. So, uh, the difference between these two things, I mean, this is the same data satisfying these three same conditions. So the only condition that's different is this boundedness condition that you have here. So previously, I think someone asked that it's uniformly bounded by one. So in particular, the absolute value of two can never be two, like it would be for the real numbers. Uh, but now I kind of fixed that. So now the absolute value of two can be two. Uh, and so this is actually some of the same picture. So there's again this thing, like for each prime number. We don't have to be in part as before. <clears throat> but now there's something extra. <clears throat> Namely, there is some kind of half interval. Um, uh, so this corresponds to the map from Z to R. And then you take the usual absolute value of R to any power P. Where p uh, goes from zero up to one, and now it looks like this was also an interval from zero up to one. But actually, uh, it's better to think of this if you take the usual absolute value. Uh, the Peter, theta. yes. Can I vote that you use alpha instead of p when talking about raising an absolute value to the pth power? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, um, just in time, <laughs> uh, to the alpha. So if I, if I parameterize this in terms of some fixed absolute P, like absolute value, say the one where absolute value of P is one over P, uh, then this line here, there corresponds to these to the alpha, where now alpha can be anything from zero to infinity. <clears throat> uh, but if for the real numbers, you fix the usual absolute value, <clears throat> then you can raise it, you can try to raise it to any real power, and it will definitely satisfy this condition and this condition. But actually, if you want the trial inequality to be satisfied, you realize <clears throat> that this happens only if alpha is at most one. Uh, so in this sense, this, this line for the real numbers, uh, it's actually some uh, stops in the middle compared to the others. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> uh, right. So, where are we? Uh, right. So, we are trying to understand uh, a little bit about the geometry of what this n spectrum of Z long series Q actually looks like. <clears throat> And it's basically the same as the Berkowitz spectrum. <clears throat> and this is five over the Berkowitz spectrum of the integers. And now let's actually try to understand uh, what are all the fibers, right, of this map. <clears throat> oh, And so, for example, if you, if you take uh, the fiber at a prime p of like just fp, um, well, then it's just one point. So then, as usual, some other formation of uh, Dirkovich space from used with uh, some kind of fiber products. And so, if you send the product of rings, there would be fp along series q. And I mean, this is just a point. Um, Because it's already 
uh, non Hamiltonian fields. And you fix the absolute value of Q to be the half, like we just Okay, so in characteristic P, the thing has just uh, one fiber, which is this kind of yeah, the wrong series ring. Okay. Maybe I should have said that. I mean, this proposition is basically just Ostrowski zero, right? Because it finds the absolute values on Q. Um, right. Um, but then uh, you can also, okay, so you, you, you have this Dirkovich space of the integers. <clears throat> and then for each P, uh, you, you have this half line here. Uh, a lot of pieces. Right. <clears throat> <And clears throat> so if you base change to this whole half line of Q piece, um, if someone looking at the <clears throat> You're in some sense taking, now this is some kind of punctured open unit disk, and now you're, this space change to QP will actually be some kind of punctured open unit disk of a QP. So this will actually be a punctured. And uh, this map here to this to this uh, line zero infinity, or depending on how you parameterize it, zero one or whatever, um, uh, this will actually be an inclination of the radius map. Uh, but actually, uh, in a slightly funny way, there's one over the log of the radius or something like this, and I won't get it straight. Um, so there, there is a whole function of the unit disk here, of a key theme, which has <clears throat> like an origin um, and a boundary, so to say. Uh, that's not quite in there. <clears throat> and whenever you fix a specific point on here, then the spider will be some specific annulus in here, of where the absolute value is fixed. <clears throat> um, and now you can wonder what happens if you move towards. I'm sure, cloud truck is invisible, anyways, but uh, I'm always tempted to try. Um, <clears throat> so you, the pre image is this circle here. And then when you move towards, uh, towards this characteristic P point, right? Uh, so at the end of this ray, at the end here, that would be Q. And at the end here, that would be FP. Um, and if, if you move towards FP, actually, this annulus here goes towards the outside of the function of open unit disk. And in some sense, the FP wrong series G sits, or wrong series Q, it sits near the boundary of this, of this annulus. <laughs> um, whereas when you uh, move onwards on this ray, go towards Q, uh, then you will get other annuli, and they will get closer to the origin. Okay, so what what does this thing actually look like? Um, <clears throat> so there is one generic point, which is Q along series Q. And then 
Uh, there are special points which are FQ wrong for this cube. And on the way there, you have some function open unit that's still with GT. The region is in the middle of the function open unit that's still with GT. <coughs> and the slightly mind bending thing is that, yeah, how, how the different parts are like, glued to each other. I mean, the whole thing is a compact host of space, so it makes sense like, to ask when you go in this direction, where do you end up? Um, and so, yeah, so if you move towards the puncture of this open unit disk, uh, you move towards uh, this point and move towards the boundary, uh, you end up towards this point. So this whole space is some of space that has periodic regions for each P. Each periodic region is a punctured open unit disk of a GP. And then they're glued to each other in this funny way, yeah, where for each one, if you go towards the center, you will end up at the common point, which is this uh, kind of generic point. And for each one, when you go towards the boundary, you end up in characteristic P. So you mentioned this fact that this map is national. Quotient. Right. Is this special, special for this ring? No, no, it's for any like Tate Uber ring. Oh. Ah, Tate Uber. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So for these three rings, actually, the two series are extremely different, right? Because we saw that, like, if you take just the integers here, then the added spectrum of that would just be uh, like this non, very non hausdorff thing. Like the spectrum of a ring is like very non hausdorff Um. Uh. But once you introduce this extra Topology is an important variable that allows you to fix absolute values, and then it's actually the two series are extremely closely related. All right, but uh, but I mean, this already suggests <laughs> to look at a variant. Uh, of zero on series Q uh, at the binary brain. <clears throat> Where I mean, we would like to now, like we've already seen that for the Berkowitz space of the integers, there's a natural way to enlarge this picture uh, by instead of doing this kind of non Archimedean normal the integers, we can put the usual norm and then there is some Archimedean part that's naturally contained in there. Um, and we could, of course, try to do the similar thing for zero wrong series Q, um, <clears throat> where we put the usual norm on V. And well, like today from the start, I kind of made the choice that the absolute value of Q was a half, and so far it didn't really matter. Now it actually suddenly starts to matter a little bit, and it's a bit weird. Okay, but it simply declared the absolute value of Q to be a half. Uh, so, concretely, and there are like Z wrong polynomials uh, with an or <coughs> the normal sum and Z almost all to zero, A and sends Q to the end is. <coughs> The sum of the usual norms of the ands uh, times one over two to the ands. <clears throat> and then we can just complete this ring.
<laughs> like the operation I'm currently doing, they're kind of tailored to match literally work which is original theory, where which is about binary frames. Uh, when we actually do this in our theory, we will do something something slight different operation, but it's extremely closely related. Um, complete as the binary thing. <laughs> Uh, to get some thing over for D or curious Q a hall, um, <clears throat> which are those times A times Q to the end, that's it. So A and times the half to the one over two to the end. It's fine, I think. Uh, so these are completely um, uh, yeah, messy, but um, <laughs> these are, I mean, these converge. Uh, for values Q in the complex numbers uh, that are uh... so yeah yeah yes they do converge if it's, it's not so hard. and <clears throat> and they define a holomorphic function of Q in the region where Q is less than a half and this holomorphic function extends to a continuous function on the whole. Uh, And now, right, so uh, I apologize for doing this, for the people taking notes. Um, <clears throat> but now, what happens if I look instead of the Berkowitz space now of this ring, where I put this extra Archimedean convergence condition? <clears throat> so now, uh, that the ring is matched to the non Archimedean part anymore. So it's now just maps to uh, this Berkowitz space for Z with its usual absolute value. <clears throat> which has this extra real part. And now we can try to understand uh, <clears throat> instead what happens when you pull back uh, to this half interval of uh, roots. <clears throat> And that pullback will be precisely uh, uh, this open unit is. Uh, actually, modulo complex conjugation. <clears throat> because two complex conjugate things, they give the same as with volume. And again, uh, Right, so uh, now it's more literally like this, basically this projection here is some kind of radius of function where the point of radius of that's Q, actually goes two equal to a half, they're really equal towards this boundary point here. <laughs> and when you go towards zero, uh, then you uh, go down this line. And so then again, you end up, end up here. <clears throat> so, so what does the space look like? So now it has <coughs> some kind of function open unit is for each place of the rational number. So the PDIC place and the Archimedean place. Um, and everywhere when you go towards the center, uh, you always end up at the center point of this picture. Uh, the slightly awkward feature of this picture is that <coughs> I had to now specify the absolute value of Q in advance. And then at the Archimedean part of this picture, this, this function of new is just stopped at, at radius. Uh -huh. Although, like from the perspective of the tail elliptic curve, there was no reason for stopping at Q equal to a half, but I could extend it to the whole function of new Okay.
<clears throat> right, and so then there, uh, <clears throat> right, so then one, that, uh, but like this is precisely the kind of picture in which we would like to combine uh, non Euclidean and Archimedean geometry. I mean, so this, this space literally has parts which are literally complex analytic or real uh, theoretic analytic things, but they sit together in one John sink. Um, and so one kind of concrete version of the question uh, about existence of analytic ring structures um, is now uh, like can one <clears throat> and uh, this guy or more or less any final algebra for that, that matter um, was a natural analytic ring structure. And uh, this has been a question that was very much in our minds uh, back when we first found out about the solid theory and then tried to really go further, and, um, and which we eventually answered with the theorem. Uh, yes, uh, namely the liquid energy construction. I mean, it actually turns out that to define this one, it's slightly better. Uh, to work with not just precise the half convergence conditions, but functions which converge on some rate, some slightly larger disk. Uh, so there's a union of all radii which are bigger than a half. Of the things that converge in the radius on right. <laughs> oh, no, that's more of a technical point. <clears throat> and so, more, ge more generally speaking, like for any kind of one of ring which has a topological uniform unit in the usual way, uh, you can produce this kind of liquid analytic ring stretch. <clears throat> and the resulting theory will be extremely close. Uh, to work with a theory, and this is something that we want to discuss at some point. Um, today, however, uh, I want to also talk about something else, something that we only found out a few weeks ago. I maybe right. uh, so once you, you have this with liquid and liquid structure over Z long series Q maybe greater than a half, uh, you can literally repeat the construction of the table of the curve uh, that I did in the beginning over this ring, and all they all bring up from the extreme here. I guess you could also just do it in Berkovich's theory. Um, and then so I'll show that the table of the curve is definitely defined over this ring. And then, okay, in the end, you could also make a half larger and larger and would get, get that it's the final way over the whole open unit disk. But you would not get this way, <clears throat> uh, this strange polynomial draws bound on the coefficients. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, let me make a, a kind of somewhat philosophical or personal digression. Um, so the mindset uh, back when we did this, so back in 2019, or back until very recently, uh, was that if you want to define an analytic ring structure, What you should do, and what we've somehow done in all the examples where we produce them, uh, uh, is to define, is to describe the three complete one. Uh, 
And okay, maybe actually have enough time to actually specify a few examples. <clears throat> So when you take so in all the examples, I will take D to be an inverse limit of uh, finite sets as n, or let me actually use I as index in directly. <clears throat> so there's a, let's say, light uh, finite set. And so something we've seen is that if you want to describe the three solid modules on S, then they have a very, very simple description. Um, uh, this is actually just the limit of all the three modules on Mobius. And this also has a meaning in terms of uh, measures in a sense. So it's also like integer values measures of this profile access. So to define a measure, you just have to assign an integer to each global subset in which way, in a way which is apparently additive. Um, uh, actually, let me just start with a different example. I think I already said it at one point, uh, but let me stress it again. You can actually also describe the abstractly free modules uh, without any completion. They actually turn out to uh, sit inside there. Um, and it's some of the L0 bounded part. Uh, in which in which sense? Uh, so in this case, actually, the more natural map goes from. We can take right that um, It's a union over all uh, integers <laughs> of the inverse limit for i of the part of the free module on SI. So this is just some finite free abelian group but with a specified basis. <laughs> And so then you can define an L0 norm, uh, where you just uh, yeah, okay, I mean, maybe <clears throat> well, I guess this can be the same as L1, but it's still like to call it L0. Um, <clears throat> so you want to sum at most and sum at most and uh -huh. What is the difference? <clears throat> so on each of these finite free guys, uh, you have the basis vectors, and then you're allowed to take some final fine bounded summit by at most n of them. <clears throat> so this gives you in each of these things, it just, just gives you a finite subset, and it takes the limit of all of these guys. So this gives you some profinite set, and then it takes a union of all of these. Gives you a certain small subset here. Um, so there is actually a description uh, of um, of the liquid energy structure of the three modules. Um, right. <clears throat> uh, so yes. Yeah. Let's endow. <laughs> um. 
from the from A and from this where this integer is passing as i all times q to the n times as i. <coughs> Uh, to be the sum of the absolute values of C and S, as usual. Then in this R thing, we take the absolute value of Q to be R. And uh, right, and these SIs are no more. Um, <clears throat> then the three. Liquid modules um, on S over this ring were kind of defined to be, and then the Hodge theorem is to prove that this is actually an analytic ring comes from an analytic ring structure, defined to be the following thing. Oh. Let me use a little bit of space here. So, I mean, just like the ring is this union of all radii bigger than a half, also the three modules are this union of all radii bigger than a half. <clears throat> and then, but then also as in, like the free discrete guy, um, we have this union over all uh, size bounds, and this time I maybe want to uh, index them by some uh, real number, c greater than zero. <clears throat> but then once you fix the radius and uh, the size, you're just taking an inverse limit of such free modules. <clears throat> of the part where this norm that I've just defined there is at most C. And so this is a similar situation where you can show that if you bound uh, the norm here and you give this a certain kind of topology, then this actually becomes the compact cost of thing. The inverse limit is still compact cost of thing taking a union of these things. Describing it as a condensed set. <clears throat> and I mean, this is really the thing that naturally suggests itself when you try to define some notion of complete modules over this ring, because I mean, what the thing in place is like the Banach norm on this ring that you have, which is uh, defined in just this way for one element. And then of course, if you have a, a five free module, you're just summing, uh, summing the absolute values. <laughs> and so this proposal for what the three complete modules in some sense writes itself when you're trying to define an analytic ring structure on this one. Um, let me actually discuss the force example um, that like, like in the beginning of my lecture today, I was asking two questions. First, is there a natural analytic ring structure on the reals? Second, is there one which allows you to like combine the things? Now I'm starting to answer them in the opposite order. So at first I said that there's something that combines them. Uh, let me now also give the answer to the first question, what are the analytic ring structures on the reals? <clears throat> so uh, you can specialize from z uh, long series q greater than a half uh, to r by sending q to some number t here, q is less than two to the most a half. <clears throat> and well, this defines the point of the square privilege space. Uh, which maps uh, uh, to the Berkowitz space of Z. <clears throat> and so it must map actually to some power of the usual absolute value of the reals. Uh, so it actually maps to, like inside there, and you have this half interval for the reals, um, where alpha and zero one corresponds to uh, the absolute value on R to the alpha. <clears throat> And so, so in here, 
right? So it's just a possible sub interval. Uh, and, and here you also have the part of an interval of t, which went from, from zero to, to a half. <clears throat> and now this map is actually realizing some isomorphism between these two things. Uh, we parameterize writing the value of t to some number r. Uh, this can also be made explicit, namely, so not screwing up, t is a half to the alpha. No, t to the alpha is a half. That's right. <clears throat> okay, so so the value of t determines some alpha, and I could have just told you the formula let alpha be the number such that t to the alpha is a half, but this would seem slightly curious. What does it mean? I mean, the meaning is that you have a point in the square bridge space, it maps to the square bridge space of the integers, and you get some point there. This is the alpha. <clears throat> okay, so we have a little degree structure here. So we get one here, but the complete modules are just those that are complete when you just forget scalars. What are the three modules? So this means that for zero less than alpha at most one, gets a so-called alpha liquid ring structure on R. Um, okay, let me use the next one to describe the few modules. Alpha liquid representation. Yeah. Uh, so as before, uh, here it was a certain union over radii bigger than a half. Here it will be a certain union over, let me call them betas maybe, which are uh, less than alpha. <coughs> and again, the union over constants. Uh, giving down. Um, and then you do the same thing. So here you have uh, the three modules on SI, and then, like, recall that some of the alpha had corresponded to the, the absolute value on the reals, which was the absolute value to the alpha. Uh, now I'm using this union here, so I take some of the, <coughs> the alpha norm uh, is at most. So here's the um, sum of XI. Yes, I think um, in the Alberta norm, it's the sum of the two values of x and to beta. Um, note here that zero is less than beta is less than one. So this is not one of the usual kinds of norms that you would usually consider in real function analysis. And this is not locally convex. So usually when you put LP norms, the P less between one and infinity. Here we are usually going to the left and due to the non locally convex things. So you mean it's not ultra, it's not, doesn't satisfy the triangle inequality. This, this, uh, this is not a norm in the standard sense. There is no triangle inequality. No, it's better than the triangle. Or is it better? Yeah. Yes. Ah, it's not a real, it's not ah, over, yeah, so ah, is it a norm? Ah, ah because it's don't take one over beta, okay. Beta it. Um, so this, this norm satisfies the triangle inequality, but it doesn't satisfy the usual scaling axiom. So you should, or, it satisfies I know, I, the scaling me, axiom with respect to the beta power of the norm, but usually what would ask that it satisfies the scaling uh, with respect to the usual norm of the real numbers, but this, this doesn't do it. <clears throat> Uh, but I mean, most concretely, like if you, if you just, like, I don't know, for a two dimensional vector space, you look at what the unit balls, so to say, look like, then they, they have this very peculiar shape that they look something like that.
And uh, yeah, so maybe when you see this, you're tempted to think that this is a stupid uh, way to put a risk structure on the wheels, and you should rather uh, do something else. But this doesn't work. So the naive guess. Um, <clears throat> that the three complete modules on R uh, should be the Radon measures on R. The find Radon measures, one way to define them is we read just the dual for continuous functions. Um, <clears throat> does not work. Does not define them in the Um So Uh, so the way to describe the sign for measures, by the way, would be to do the similar construction here, but you just use the L1 model. Um, and this would be really closely related to the usual theory of complete local convex vector spaces in about a cleanest way as uh, the usual theory of solid, I mean, the theory of solid modules is related to the usual theory of like linearly complete modules. Um, so we were, when we developed the theory, we were really hoping that this one here is an analytic ring structure on the reals. And it was really, uh, yeah, somewhat depressing when we realized it isn't. <clears throat> but it's related to some fun stuff uh, uh, in classical function analysis. Um, so one thing we do always want um, in our analytic ring structure is that the class of complete modules are stable under extensions. But this is simply false for locally convex vector spaces. So you can have natural extension of locally convex vector spaces, even just of an L1 space by the real numbers, where the extension is not locally convex. This was realized around 1918 by Rieder and somebody else. And it comes from the entropy function. So it's, it is not some completely crazy thing. It has some kind of natural meaning, but it destroys uh, this object. But then once you allow some local, locally convex Vector space into the picture, the theory works again. But you're really forced to uh, use non locally convex. And I guess I should also discuss one other thing very quickly. Um, <clears throat> uh, so in four, we specialized uh, this, <clears throat> this uh, theory uh, to the real numbers. Uh, we could also specialize it to the periodic numbers. Um, and you would expect that, like, in terms of the Berkeley rich space, we were really just trying to extend over this missing part of the real numbers. So you would expect that maybe at the non intermediate part of the picture, we didn't really change anything. And like also the convert extra convergence condition we put uh, on, our, on, our, on our function was just some extra convergence condition into the real numbers, and it's like median fits. Uh, so naturally you would expect that when you specialize this in a liquid in the ring structure uh, on, on this convergent or symmetric ground series ring there, but back to a periodic ring, then, uh, then you would just get the solid structure, but that's not true. Uh, actually, you get new ones. You can specialize this to QP. Um, and uh, I mean, if you do the kind of similar analysis and now, okay, there's a slightly tricky issue that I can just really send Q to any fractional power of P here. Uh, this can be rectified by along the half to vary instead. Um, <clears throat> and what you see from this is that for every alpha that's in the non-like meaning case allowed to be anything between zero and infinity, 
So in other words, again, for any point of the Berkovich spectrum, really, of the integers, um, <clears throat> we get an alpha liquid ring structure. From QP. Um, again, with three modules can be described, and the formula is just the same. The QP, QP the alpha liquid one. And it's again the union over theta less than alpha and the union of all uh, constants, putting a norm <coughs> uh, of the three modules on the SI. <coughs> Uh, which you now endow with the exactly same albedo noise. That's in the non convenience. Uh, and this should be compared to uh, the solidification. This is just described in a similar way as the limit union of all constants of the limit of the TP adjoint SI. But now on these guys, it puts the infinity, L infinity order, the supreme order. So these are all top spaces in here, where you can put So suddenly you get a whole new world of analytical structures, even over the periodic numbers, where maybe you didn't feel like you need them because the solid theory already works with you. <laughs> so I want to ask a small question just to clarify possible confusion. So you have the, the, the L beta for different beta, which are again, I believe defined in the same way, uh, just by sum of the beta's power yes. without yes. taking yes. one yes. over beta, yes. J just this in the same yes. way. Yes. So actually, then... it's a slight mismatch in what I know. If I literally specialize the definition of beta to infinity, I would be summing the supremum norms, which is not what I'm doing when I do this infinity. Here it's literally the supremum norm. Here it is the... The actual ah. so there's a little bit of a mismatch in notation between here and here, but I think. Okay, but what is the, when you take union over beta in less than alpha, I think usually it was a filtered union. That is, is it the case? Because it's here case, I don't You see... have to be slightly careful that the way you index, index the constants somehow should change when you increase. Ah, so, yeah, so. So, so why, why the, the the limit the union over beta what are the inequalities between the l beta nodes here the, the first takes union over all c yes and then, and then there's it's literally the case that these spaces get larger and larger as you increase beta ah okay okay, okay. okay so i should break it it like this in some sense <laughs> okay Uh, so, in some sense, you can think of a whole series of uh, series that go from zero all the way to infinity, where we put some put the L corresponding norm here, where at this end you have uh, the product modules, and then at each point alpha here you have the alpha liquid ones. <laughs> and uh, I mean, in terms of the class of modules, uh, I mean, being solid is a much stricter condition than being alpha liquid. So, uh, <clears throat> um, the class of modules that I'll, you allow here it becomes larger and larger as you uh, make alpha closer to zero. In some sense, as you go to what zero here, you have all condensed modules because if you kind of naively put some kind of L zero norm there, uh, meaning that there. There's only a bounded number of coefficients that's non-zero, and then you put some bound. Um, then this actually recovers a free condensed module without any completion. By variant of what I said at the beginning about the integers. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, 
I guess it's funny for the uh for the uh was amusing. Um right. So back in like then we were trying to look uh find natural candidates for how what the three complete modules could be. <clears throat> and then it was some hard matter of proving that they actually define the axioms of being an analytic ring. Uh, uh, but, but this in this course, we have a different mindset. Is that to define an analytic ring structure? Uh, simply find some natural endomorphisms of this projective object P uh, that you want to be isomorphisms. The figure out in no sequence uh, that should come after completion. Uh, so the and because in large financial being groups, this P has these very strong properties like being compact and internally projective, this will always define the ring structure. <clears throat> So it's, it's become extremely easy to produce in a different way. And here in the here in the example. I mean, so it turns out that to define uh the take a look at the curve. You only really need two things. Um, the first is that Q should be a topological uniform unit. <laughs> um, right, it's definitely the topological uniform and then there should be units. Very clear. And both of these have clear meaning in terms of the underlying condensed ring, right? I mean, so topological uniform means that uh, you have a map from like basically this guy and dot with the natural uh, <clears throat> natural ring structure sending one to T to Q. Um, <clears throat> but then you need some you need some completeness for your modules. You need to be able to some certain sequences. And really the only thing you need is that one minus Q times shift acting on this uh, projective guy P. Uh, as an <clears throat> and it's clear that there's a universal example of such an analytic ring. I mean, you just take the free guy generated by chocolate thing for the unit. That's just component ring. And then <clears throat> this condition puts some analytic ring structure on this ring. And I'm also assigned, which is good. I don't have to say too much.
Maxwell theorem is that there is an initial such a structure. Okay. I mean, the existence is easy. Uh, the hard part is the description. <clears throat> hey, so it's a pair of a final and Okay. And uh, you can actually describe a triangle. <clears throat> and well, let, let me describe the underlying ring. Um, this is precisely those and those those sums a and times q to the n. You see the wrong series of p, right? You. <clears throat> such that uh, the an have at most polynomial here. <laughs> and thus, if you, like the claim is that we can do analytic geometry as usual over such rings. <clears throat> and so you can just repeat the construction of the table of the curve, and then you will see for like geometric reasons in some sense that it must live over precisely this ring with the coefficients of it most clean And uh, I can in fact describe the free uh, the free modules. So A join S now already means a free complete guy, right? So would, A triangle join S would be the free non-complete guy, but A triangle is the free complete guy. It is the union overall A greater than zero. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. So as usual, S is the limit of S size. Of finite sets of size. <laughs> um, of Yeah, this is mean something's also taking you know, this. Um, well, the limit where I <clears throat> of yeah, so, um. Of like the part of the free module, um, let's say, over the long series thing on SI, <clears throat> but where uh, the coefficient of Q to the N has a zero norm at most, we can make it N plus N to the two. Um, yeah, let me maybe in a future lecture uh, give a more precise description. But basically, you're asking, doing a similar description as before, uh, but now this time you're asking for some polynomial growth conditions uh, on the coefficients. All right. And uh, so uh, what you have written on the blackboard is barely visible to uh, in the all the indices and so on are almost invisible. So you have union over k bigger bigger than zero or bigger than or equal to zero. I mean k gets large. Okay, and then and also gets large. Um, <clears throat> basically, I I want to put say that the condition here is uh, is of size at most like. The coefficient of q to the n can grow at most uh, like a polynomial in m of degree k. So it's at most n to the k. But then I also have to allow the presence of negative coefficients. So that's why there's some kind of index n here that allows me to put negative Fourier coefficients. So anyway, then the limit. And then the is coefficient of I... q to the n has a zero norm at most n plus n to the k, which is just n at n... most what? You have limit over m or i or what? I, in the 
I, okay. And then you had the coefficient of Q to the N as L zero norm at most. N plus N to the K. N plus? N plus N to the K. What is N plus N? To N. Plus N to the K. N plus N to the K. But N plus N is 2N. N plus N. M is the exponent of Q. Ah, ah, Q to the M. Ah, Q to the M. Okay, I didn't, I didn't. Okay. Oh, I, to the K. Okay. It's... Thank you. Um, basically, if, if you want your free, if you want the ring to be, the thing where you have the things that have most polynomial growth, and you think about a way to encode that on the modules, then this is what you would, you would be doing. Um, but Peter, do you really mean L0 norm or L1 norm? Oh, uh, yeah, because it's, 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 I mean, these are again, it's about the free module on the SI, so. Yeah, but I mean, if you want the correct the answer for, if you want the correct answer for S as a point, I mean, it seems. Uh, say, yeah. yeah, I mean, so I call the L, yeah, I don't know. Let's say. L. Yeah. L1 norm? Yeah, I think so. I mean, for me, like on the discrete guy, all L0 and L1 are some of the same. But yes, let's say L1. Um, right. Uh, right. So, yeah. So within like doing analytic geometry over this space, you will get a like geometric way to construct a tape curve really over this kind of smallest ring over which it's actually defined. Um, uh, this actually also means that if you specialize back uh, to like the Phoenix numbers, then it turns out that the, the gauges here it sits somewhere. Ah, I didn't guess this, yeah? So this is called what we call the guess function. I don't know if that's and so the, the gaseous analytic ring structure is it's very close, but not quite at zero uh, in this kind of diagram. Um, and uh, it, it, it is a fun exercise to take this description here of the three modules and base change it to QP. Uh, let me not write down the formula. It's somewhat nasty. Uh, but anyways, OK, let me stop it. 